Hey there, welcome back. I am going to be going over, uh, like I said, the fulfillment passages in the Gospel of Matthew. And I am also going to cover the discourses, which help us to kind of divide up the Gospel of Matthew into its various sections. And then because we have those discourse sections, it produces a nice outline for us. And I believe this material, again, is going to be helpful for you as you read through the Gospel of Matthew. It's going to give you some helpful information to hold on to as you're going through this book. Okay, so Matthew's fulfillment quotations. One of my favorite things about the Gospel, and I hope you catch wind of this yourself and that it encourages you greatly as you read the Scripture, is the fact that this book is based in real history, reality, and we can also show it's supernatural qualities as well. And what I mean by supernatural qualities is the fact that this book was written at a certain time in human history that shows the life of Christ, but it doesn't just show it as mere history. What it's trying to do at the same time is prove to its reader that Jesus is in fact the Messiah, the one who was prophesied about in previous years. And when I say previous years, it's not like someone was thinking about this a couple of weeks before Jesus was born. For thousands of years, there have been prophecies in the Old Testament. And one of the key themes that you guys learned in your Old Testament survey class is the major plot of the scriptures. And you've probably heard this a lot from Mr. Lindsley. You've probably heard a lot from Tim Mackey and John Collins, the um, creators of the Bible Project, that there is this one story uh, that the Old Testament tells, and it's about Jesus Christ. And so as I covered the theme in the previous video, the theme is that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah whose, whose life, death, burial, and resurrection um, reveal salvation history, and it's, the, it's found in the climax of Jesus' very life. And so it's helpful for us, and I'm going to highlight these verses, Isaiah, Hosea, Jeremiah, there's an unknown prophecy, and that one kind of makes us scratch our heads. Isaiah, again, Isaiah, Isaiah, Second Chronicles, Zechariah. So scattered throughout all of the Old Testament, there are very specific prophecies of Jesus Christ. How is this helpful for us in our faith today? Because we could be like, well, that's good for the Jewish people. It was their Jewish book, and it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Good, that happened 2,000 years ago. Well, I think it's more important than that. And one of the reasons I think it's more important than that is because it's prophecy. Prophecy is the fulfillment of God's word written hundreds and thousands of years ago. Now, the chances of anything like this happening are slim to none. And so this gives us proof that God's very word is supernatural. No human being and at best, a collection of humans scattered out throughout history can all say um, the same thing about Jesus Christ written hundreds of years before. Hopefully that makes sense. If you have any questions about prophecy specifically, please ask um, during the cohorts. But here we have some basic and common ones that I'm sure we're all familiar with, but hopefully we can see the impact of this as it relates to real history. So Isaiah prophesied that Jesus... Um, would have this supernatural birth experience, born of a virgin. Hosea would describe how Jesus would escape to and return from Egypt. And he was writing about this hundreds of years before Jesus. Jeremiah would prophesy about the murder of the infants of Bethlehem, that tragic event in the early life of Christ. And they would prophesy about these things. And here's an unknown prophecy that Jesus' childhood would be in Nazareth. And then another one, Isaiah, Jesus establishes his ministry in Galilee. That's a pretty specific prophecy, right? All of these are, but even down to the geographical location. And then Isaiah would prophesy that Jesus would heal disease our infirmities and forgive us of our sins. And that whole chapter, what a beautiful chapter that is describing what Jesus Christ would do for us. Hundreds of years before, again, Jesus fulfills the role of a servant. That's kind of seemingly a basic one, but it's hard to be a servant. And Jesus would be a servant to those in need. Jesus speaks in parables, fulfilling Psalm 78 and Chronicles. 
Jesus enters Jerusalem as the humble king, Zechariah. And then Jesus is betrayed for the 30 pieces of silver. Very specific prophecy here, fulfilling Zechariah once again. All of these are prophecies written before the life of Christ to help the reader understand that this book, Matthew, is a big deal, a very big deal. It should get our attention. It should help us understand that this book is true. No other book, now you can mark my words on this, no other book in any other religion in all of human history has been able to have so many prophecies about one person fulfilled. I remember in one of my Buddhism classes at Oregon State, the late Dr. Blumenthal, he was one of my professors. He was a Buddhist. He did translations for the Dalai Lama and um, many other um, religious people in Buddhism that are very um, well known, Dalai Lama being the most significant. But anyway, I remember asking him the question and others would ask when we were going over the prophecies in Buddhism, have any of these come true? And he would say, no, not yet. Um, and, and so we would kind of talk about that and say, well, it's interesting how in Christianity then, all of these prophecies about Jesus have come true, except one, which is his return. And if all of these prophecies have come true, except that one, which is, re is his return, I, want, I bet you anything that one, which is his return, will come true. And, and so it really helps me as uh, a modern thinker, someone who really likes facts and historicity, to know for certain that we can trust and rely on the scriptures. Another thing I want to cover in this video um, would be the discourses in Matthew and the outline. And the discourses help us create the outline. So there are five major discourses of Matthew's gospel. And we know there are five major discourses of Matthew's gospel because each of the discourses would end with these words. And it came about when Jesus finished these words. All right. So that's kind of like the marker in the gospel of Matthew. And it happens five times. So you have that happening in chapter 7, verse 28 in this section, which is the Sermon on the Mount. You have Jesus saying, and it came about when Jesus finished these words in 11, verse 1. And he's basically commissioning the disciples, go out and do what I'm doing, Jesus says. And then Jesus says, and it came about when Jesus finished these words in 1353, which would be the parables of the kingdom. And it says again, and it came about when Jesus finished these words, 19.1, and that's on church, life, and discipline. And finally, and it came about when Jesus finished these words in chapter 26, verse 1, and it's this section, woes and all of it discourse. I was very repetitive there to hopefully get it into your mind. In chapter 7, 11, 13, 19, and 26, it uses that phrase, and it came about when Jesus finished these words. So that has something to do with the structural quality of Matthew's gospel. Matthew decided to use that phrase to help the reader understand, oh, here's a new section, and we're moving on to the next section. This really helps us with the outline as we look at Matthew's gospel. And you're probably thinking, wait a second, I thought there were five. Why do you have six? Primarily as you're creating an outline, it doesn't have to follow the exact discourse material or that phrase that I just mentioned in the previous slide. Because what most Jesus scholars do as they're looking at the Gospel of Matthew, they look at having a prologue. And they also look at having an ending. So some lists even have seven here. And so you have a prologue, which is the genealogy and birth narrative, chapters one through two. That's the first section. Second section would be the appearance of the Messiah. And that happens in chapters three through four. And then the third section, you have the ministry of the Messiah to Israel. Fourth section, you have the responses to the Messiah, which is really rejection by Israel and acceptance by the disciples. And then the fifth section, you have the Messiah confronts Jerusalem when he goes in and has confrontation with the Jewish leadership. And then after that confrontation, the sixth section, you have the Messiah is rejected, but in his rejection, he's victorious. And that outlines in chapters 26 and 28, which is the passion and the resurrection. In the next video, I'm going to go a little bit more in detail on each of the sections here, providing more helpful information to guide your thinking as you're reading through the gospel. So thank you again for spending this time with me. We'll see you next time.